presentation, I will present some um, uh, new results to understand what's the physics beyond the Kibozura mechanism, and I will try to uh, explain why this is uh, relevant for quantum annealing as well. So these are the two groups I work with in the University of Luxembourg. This work was done mainly with the group of Adolfo. And uh, so let me just uh, show you all the people that work with me. So the, um, the problem would be this. I will try to motivate why the Zurich mechanism is uh, interesting and what one can uh, inspect beyond the prediction of the mechanism itself. And to do that, I will argue that large deviations theory is a good um, uh, theoretical tool to be used. And I will uh, ask, um, use it as an example the transverse field easing model because it's uh, exactly solvable, so there is a lot of control on the equations, but the structure will be the same also for other type of phase transitions which are not exactly solvable. This would be this case of classical phase transitions, which I will not have time to present, also it's not very related to quantum annealing, so we'll just probably skip it depending on time. So, let me start from the Kibazura mechanism itself. I will um, exemplify it in a thermal situation, but the same thing happens if you are in a quantum setting and you're varying not the temperature of your system, but a parameter in instead. So you see that you have a system coupled to a bath, let's say this is a simple easing uh, ferromagnet, and so as you lower the temperature of your bath, you will likely encounter a phase transition and you will find ordered states at low temperature. And this is true if you uh, lower the tempera temperature of your bath quasi statically, but we are interested in lowering it uh, in, a, in a finite time. And so the main question one can ask is uh, what can one say about this out of equilibrium protocol of varying a parameter of your extensive system in a finite time? Uh, what happens um, uh, in the low temperature state because of the critical point that has been crossed? And so one, what one should use are the scaling relations coming from the theory of uh, phase transitions, and I will just need these two for the correlation length and the relaxation time of equilibrium dynamics expressed in terms of the reduced temperature or any other control parameter. So the idea of Kibben and Zurek is to say that if one uh, lowers the temperature quasi-statically, then all the equilibrium states are sampled during your uh, procedure, while if you go fast, when you get too close to the phase transition, because of critical slowing down, you will, be, you will become basically frozen, and the type of states that you find near the phase transitions will be carried over to lower temperatures. And so one can um, schematically split this uh, schedule into an adiabatic region, where you are able to follow your instantaneous state, because uh, the relative rate of, the rate of change in your parameter, it's much uh, faster than the uh, relaxation rate. So in terms of times, it's the opposite. Uh, your system is able to, this, is, this black line is the relaxation rate of your system, and so your system is able to adapt fastly to the change in the external parameter. Near the phase transition, this must diverge, so there will be an inversion, and here you get frozen. So using this simple uh, understanding, one can predict quantitatively what is the number uh, of, for example, topological defects formed in the ordered phase, so the number of impurities that are formed at the, at the end of your protocol. So one has just to identify where is this phase out time here by equating the rate of change in the uh, external parameter and the relaxation rate at equilibrium of your system. And from there, you can compute the correlation length at the moment of freeze out. And from there, you just assume that uh, every uh, linear separation, even by psi hat, the correlation length that you have got frozen at, you will find a defect. So, for example, here a vortex anti vortex pair. And using uh, this simple uh, relax uh, linear annealing schedule uh, with a time tau that quantifies how fast you are going, you find this nice formula here, which is relating the density of defects found in a completely out of equilibrium protocol to uh, critical exponents that are instead given by the equilibrium criticality. So this is why this mechanism is important, because it's giving us out of equilibrium information out uh, from uh, equilibrium information. So this is the main formula predicted by the Kibazura mechanism, which ends up here. 
So what can one see in uh, real experiments is that this formula holds pretty well. So one takes snapshots of uh, systems that have been cooled slowly or fastly, and there is actually uh, a great dependence on the number of here the topological defects are domain walls. So you have less domain walls if you have annealed slowly, because you have given the, si the system more time to form large domains. You can also plot this data in log loss scale and find that the um, number of defects scale uh, with the, the correct power law. These are, I think, the best uh, data so far on a D-Wave machine, which show in particular that what I've been talking about applies pretty well to quantum phase transitions as well. So, uh, the kibble zurich mechanism, as I presented it now, was applied to the average number of defects formed in the final state. But can we say something beyond this average number? Can we characterize the final state at a finer uh, scale. So one, what one can do, what one would like to do, is to access all the correlations. But this is uh, a bit difficult, both from the theoretical and practical uh, side. It is easier to, to uh, start by accessing the fluctuations in the number of defects, because these go beyond uh, the average, but they are easier to access both uh, on a, from a practical and a, an analytical level, and still you're getting more information, so you can see how much of the Kibble-Zurich mechanism itself uh, holds beyond this uh, very rough average prediction. What has been done so far, uh, there, there have been uh, both theoretical and experimental studies. Here you see a uh, sort of uh, uh, Monte Carlo of a 5-4 theory, and you see that actually the probability distribution of the number of defects changes with the annealing time. And what was found is that this probability distribution is quite consistent with what is called the Poisson binomial, which is basically the distribution of the sum of independent Bernoulli variables. Here instead, from the experimental data, you see that there is a, a very good uh, agreement uh, that with, the prediction, with the same prediction here, because you see that the Poisson binomial distribution has the property that all the cumulants scale with the same power law it is given by the mean. And so this was uh, uh, well represented by this experiment. But can one say more? Can one understand all this feature from a unified perspective? What is the reason behind this Poisson binomial distribution? Well, a possible way to understand this is through large deviations theory. Um, let me just make this couple of slides to give uh, a, a sort of presentation of what large deviations is. The uh, large addition principle is when you uh, have this equation holding here. Uh, there is a log here missing, sorry. So you can look at this formula, which is correct. Basically, you are saying that you have, you have a sequence of random variables depending on a large parameter n. And for large n, you get this simple form of the probability distribution. So you just one function, i, which is called the rate function, is governing the probability distribution of your sequence of random variables at all different n. So you have found a simple scaling with n. This is a practical example to see what this uh, thing looks like uh, uh, for the Poisson binomial distribution itself. So if we take x to be the sum of independent Bernoulli variables, one can do the computation exactly and find that the rate function is given by this uh, form here. And so the function i of x, once you exponentiate it and multiply by n, governs pretty well the, um, the form of the probability distribution already at moderate n. You don't have to go to n uh, 10 to the 6. If you already are, uh, this is, uh, for example, 100, and, and the curves are basically not distinguishable. So what, uh, how to access this large aviation rate function? What one usually does is to uh, use the gartner ennis theorem, which is a sort of microcanonical canonical equivalence. So you see here that you can compute, uh, this is a sort of free energy of the uh, uh, random variables xn. Once you compute it, you do a, a, a Bechamp transform, and you get the rate function, which is instead of a sort of a microcanonical en um, uh, entropy. So you, you see that we don't have even to uh, learn new instruments. You just have to use basic statistical mechanics, just interpreted in a mathematical framework to do the, all, the, all the computations. So let me now specify to the case at hand, which is uh, the transfer field easing model, but other models can be studied as well. So this is. The Hamiltonian, oops, sorry. This is the Hamiltonian I would be interested in. It's a, a ferromagnet or paramagnet, depending on the relative strength of the transverse and uh, uh, easing interactions. This model can be diagonalized uh, by Jordan Bigner and then Bogolyubov transformations. 
you see here that he will uh, uh, decouple completely all the momenta into separate uh, modes with this dispersion here. So from this dispersion, one can understand what is the phase diagram of the model. You see that at large transverse field G, the model is a paramagnet, then you have a phase transition in the universality class of the two-dimensional classicalism model, and then a ferromagnet at lower values. And what we will do, we will start at very large G and lower the magnetic field across the phase transition and end up at zero, where the model is purely ferromagnetic. So this is uh, the same thing I said, but plotted against time. You pull linearly. So how to characterize the final state reached by the dynamics? Since you would like to have the ground state in the end, the ground state is just a string of aligned spins, all the defects in this case are the domain walls. So to count them, one can introduce this operator here, which is basically counting the number of pairs of defects, because they must be created in pairs by parity. And this operator is diagonal in the Bogolyubov base, so all the computations can be done exactly for the, this model. And these are operators, of course, because we are talking about a quantum model, but once you take a snapshot of your final state, you get a random variable, which depends on a large number n, which is the size of your system. So this is the setting to which one can apply large deviation theory. One can solve exactly the dynamics of the model in order to compute what is the um, uh, operator uh, counting number of defects at the final time, but it's not very clear if uh, one just uses the parabolic cylinder function solution. So let's use the landau zener approximation. This is the probability of exciting a, a kink in mode K, and this is the uh, simplified result with respect to the parabolic cylinder functions of before. You see here that the gap is very small for uh, uh, the low energy, sorry, the low momentum mode, but then it becomes larger as you increase the momentum. So the, um, the integral that gives, for example, the average number of defects formed is, not, is dominated by the very low case, then, it, then the probability of exciting a mode goes, off, uh, goes down uh, um, Gaussianly fast. So one can uh, extend the integral to infinity, perform the Gaussian integration, and find out that the, number, the average number of defects is a power law with the exponent matching the kibel zurek mechanism. This was known uh, for a long time now. So everything matches. But let's go beyond this average prediction. We have to compute the cumulant generating function in order to access the rate function. If you plug in uh, the operator that counts the kinks in the exponent, you find that this factorizes, thanks to the integrability, and you find this expression here. So this expression is interesting for two reasons. First, we need pk, which was given the average, and nothing more. We just have to use the same information we had already computed. We don't have to compute more complicated correlation functions of the defects. And second, this uh, uh, cumulant generating function of the number of defects has the form of the cumulant generating function of a Poisson binomial distribution. So you can really here assign uh, an interpretation to where the sum of independent trials comes from. It comes from the separation into modes. If you go instead to a real space representation, you can really think of it as um, defects forming at, at a certain distance, so they're causally dis disconnected. So this, in this case, there is a bit of a mo more of an interpretation of why one should find independent defects in the model. So uh, let me take also a large tau limit in order to simplify uh, the formula here, so you pass to the logarithm, you find this integral here, you apply uh, an expansion in large tau, and you find this formula. So this is one of the important results of this work. Why is this form of the cumulant generating function interesting? Well, because it splits into quite, two, quite different parts, because there is an overall, an overall prefactor, which is exactly the kibel zurek density, so tau to the minus one half. And I think which instead is doesn't contain any information about the protocol. So all the information about the protocol of annealing comes into the kibel zurek average. So there is no competition between different uh, time scales or length of the system or whatever. Everything is encoded in the kibel zurek density for the whole probability distribution. So when you go back to the rate function by Lajan transforming, this, structures, this structure remains. What does this mean? This means that Basically, the Kibel-Zurek average is controlling all the distribution in this sense 
that the most probable value is given by the kibble zurek density itself, and then the rate function has a certain shape around it that is well captured by this uh, Landau-Zener approximation. You see here that if you go to longer and longer annealing times, you fall into it, while you don't fall onto the central limit theorem prediction. So there is more structure than just average and uh, second moment. Also, the third moments and fourth moment uh, do matter. But for the physical interpretation of what is going on, uh, it's better to use these kind of bounds that are obtainable through large aviation theory. So you just have to use this, the Chernoff bound here in order to understand that the probability of having a density of defects greater than rho is exponentially suppressed by the rate function on both tails. What does this mean? This means that if you anneal a large system and you ask, will I get less defects than the kibble zurek uh, prediction? Well, you will get a, a, a number of defects which is not kibble zurek only with an exponentially small probability in the system size. You cannot just hope that you do more annealings and you will eventually find a state with less defects. You will find with probability one in the thermodynamic limit only the number of defects predicted by kibble zurek if you anneal too fast. Of course, this applies to um, annealing schedules which are not um, adiabatic. You are, you are going a bit faster than adiabatic. So I still have more time. I can illustrate why this also holds in a classical setting. So let's suppose that we have a thermal phase transition again. And let us partition the system into sort of proto-domains of uh, linear size psi hat. So we have cooled the system from high temperature to low temperature. And then we freeze out at the freeze out time. The system will be correlated only uh, between uh, certain uh, domains which are causally disconnected. And once you continue annealing at a very fast rate, nothing much changes. You are almost frozen. The only thing that can happen is that some of these domains may recombine into each other. But this happens with a probability of order one. So still, you will have domains that are disconnected with a linear size of order psi hat. So if you use this kind of simplified picture, you can work out what is the probability of finding uh, a density um, uh, which is rho. And uh, if you uh, use the, the, the formulas for uh, independent defect formation because of this causal disconnection into sectors, into not sectors, sorry, into uh, real, real space separated parts, you find that the uh, rate function for this probability distribution is again given by a formula which has the same form that we, I showed you before. So there is this prefactor, which is given by the kibble density. It has a universal meaning in the sense of phase transitions, plus something else, which is uh, quantifying how much you deviate from the universal prediction. So again, you can apply the Chernoff bound, con concentration inequalities. Here, in, the, in this case, you also have a probabilistic meaning for the rate function you found, because it is a sort of an instance of Sanov's theorem, which states that uh, the kulbach weber divergence is uh, controlling the rate function uh, at, in the exponent. So, and uh, the connection is that the kulbach, kulbach weber divergence is uh, quantifying how far you are with the number of defects you have measured from the one predicted by the most probable value. So what one can do practically in, a, in an experiment is to uh, before I showed you that plot that was showing the cumulants, what one can do with the data that we already have? Well, one can plot the logarithm of the probability distribution and quantify how much it deviates from uh, the, the simple prediction, which is the um, Poisson binomial distribution, because that would uh, highlight, for example, how much defects interact, what is there beyond the kibble zurich mechanism in a, in a real platform. So this is why and we are stressing that this large aviation theory provides a unified framework because if you instead look, for example, at cumulants, what you can do is try to uh, fit them maybe with some empirical formula, but here you really stare at what is the full probability distribution of your, uh, of your mechanism, of the defects, and so you can argue what is the mechanism behind that generates them. So I think I leave five minutes for questions, so let me conclude. I have uh, motivated why the kibble zurich mechanism is interesting, why the physics beyond the average predictions of the mechanism are interesting. And I've shown you a couple of examples where one can actually 
do all the passages with control and find the rate function. And, and so they provide sort of a benchmark to what is uh, there beyond. Because if we find some deviations from this picture, that, that means that there is something beyond the cable the Kibbutzuri mechanism. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Federico. We have time for questions. I, I thought that all the work by Adolf Del Campo several years ago for the case of the one-dimensional transverse field icing model solved the problem completely in the sense that he derived the expression of the expressions of the cumulants of the distribution, which completely specifies the distribution. And I'd like to know what aspect you have gone beyond that work. Something should be done because the same author is in the list. <laughs> yes, yes. So what we did was try to, um, because as Adolfo did that work alone, he was basically saying, uh, look for the transverse field leasing model, it's exactly solvable so we can compute whatever, I will compute the cumulants. So here what we did was, okay, can we set up a theory which we benchmark on the exactly solvable model because we have everything under control, but then can we uh, try to give some guidelines to what one can do with a general model? So is there, is there some probabilistic interpretation behind? And, and we have proposed this uh, sort of Kulbach Leiber uh, uh, distance of what you uh, find from what you um, measure, from what you expect. And then the other difference here is that uh, by using large deviation theory, you borrow all the tools of concentration inequalities, for example, that uh, were not clear to be used from uh, the previous approach. So what we want to do here is sort of a unified approach to understand what is a way to tackle this beyond Kibble-Zurich physics at the level of fluctuations. Of course, this does, does not encompass correlations, which have been done by other groups for the exactly solvable model, but not in general. Okay, may I ask you another question? Uh, can you calculate the correlation between the positions of kinks, which is very important in some respect we measure that? This uh, correlation. Yes, in this works. It was, in this works, it was done for the um, sorry the first two. This this one is another model. So the first two works computed exactly the correlation functions, and they found yes, that. Yeah, I know they work. Mm -hmm. and can you can you yourself do something about it beyond them? Uh, so I still didn't didn't look at the uh, probability distribution of the uh, maybe the correlation. I, I'm personally working on that because these works, uh, as, you, as you know, they put forward the idea that there is something strange because the correlation fall off Gaussian limit distance, not exponentially as one would expect from the Fritz out mechanism. So there must be something behind there. And, uh, and in particular, the work, the work, this work here by also Roderick Mössner, there was uh, some sort of coarsening uh, implied behind. So this is not very clear. Probably in the correlations, you, since you go to a finer detail even more, you, you will find beyond Kibble-Zurich physics in the sense that different mechanisms also are at play, like coarsening. But uh, using large deviation theory is not that uh, clear to me how, because this is more thought for the fluctuations in numbers rather than correlations. Thank you. Any other questions for Federico? If not, uh, let's thank Federico one more time. Thank you.